Hey there, and welcome to the Farm Traveler podcast. This is episode 31, and our guest today is the Dr. Kevin Folta from the University of Florida. So Dr. Folta is a professor in the Horticultural Science Department and spends his spare time advocating for genetic engineering and bridging the gap between science and consumers. So Dr. Folta is going to tell us about his research, why GMO crops are valuable, how we can fight misinformation, and kind of the dangers of that misinformation when it comes to genetic engineering. He's also going to touch base on the banana situation going on in Uganda. You might have heard about it. It's called the Matoke banana. It's a genetically engineered variety of bananas that has been created to help fight vitamin deficiencies in Uganda. Kids are dying when they're about two or five years old because of a vitamin A deficiency. And this Matoke banana has been developed to have great amounts of vitamin A in it. And so the Uganda government's been going back and forth. And so Dr. Fulton is going to tell us how that's going on right now and what's happening in Uganda. Seriously, be sure to check him out. He's got a great podcast also. It's called Talking Biotech with Dr. Kevin Folta. Check it out. It's on iTunes. He's got a lot of really cool episodes with a lot of great information. Hope you enjoy it. This is episode 31 with Dr. Kevin Folta. All right. Well, Dr. Kevin Folta, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine, Trevor. Good to talk to you. This is really cool. Hey, well, thanks for being on. So you are a professor and the department chair at the University of Florida, specifically the Horticulture Science Department. So you do, it seems like on the internet, you are the go-to guy when it comes to gene editing. So before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got started with the world of gene engineering. Well, I, I should tell you right off the bat, I'm not the chairman anymore of the department. That ended about a year ago, um, but that allowed me to go back to my laboratory full time. And I got started with genes, genetic engineering, all that stuff when I was 10 and was very excited about recombinant DNA at 10 years old. Um, the ideas of genetics and heredity have always been intriguing to me, like those old books where they would have the guy with too many chromosomes or not enough and missing, you know, with the black bar over the eyes. I always thought that stuff was intriguing and was very fortunate to study it through college and have great mentors throughout graduate school and um, wonderful opportunities to do this for a career. So I'm very grateful for that. And one of the few people I know who has known what he wanted to do his entire life and actually got to it. Hey, well, that's cool. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, so I actually graduated from UF and I've got a minor in environmental horticulture. I graduated back in 2014. And you probably know him, Dr. Clark. He has a plants, gardens, and you class that I took. And it was really cool because every week he would bring plants. We would take home tomato plants, coleus plants, um, banana plants. It was really cool because it was like an entry level class. And so you would have a whole bunch of people throughout the university to take that class. And it was a lot of really cool stuff. Have you worked with Dr. Clark on anything? Sure. Yeah, we've had collaboration before, but mostly Dave and I spend, uh, we spend time fishing and having a beer and watching football. So we collaborated on lots of different things, both in the university and out. And he's a, a really great teacher. He's been, um, led that class for years now. And always always is full so hats off to Dave yeah it was a really fun class um all right so in in layman's terms can you kind of can you kind of tell us how gene engineering works I understand that you take a gene from one species and you put it into another species like um, I was listening to one of your podcasts I believe and you take a gene from a bacteria for example and you put it into a plant um, into their gene so tell us how exactly that whole process works well, it's, it's really no different than word processing. You're essentially taking a sentence out of one script and placing it into another. And just like um, words in a book, the genes in a genome are all made up of essentially letters, these repeating codes of chemistry. And we think of that genetic code, and people have seen that G and A and T and C. It's those four chemicals, which are, you know, glycine, or glycine, uh, guanosine, adenine, thymidine, and uh, cytosine that are, um, their, their order of those GAs, Ts, and Cs gives a very distinct code inside genetics. And so we can take the DNA, because DNA is DNA, whether you're bacterial or whether you're a virus or whether you're a, um, you know, you. Um, and so the DNA has kind of interchangeable parts. It's um, the fact that it uses the same kind of general mechanism to turn on and off. It means that we have 
inherently the ability to switch parts between one organism and another and see how that information behaves in a different context. It's like taking the parts out of, um, you know, the bathroom out of one blueprint and placing it into another and having a house built with that one modification. So how it happens in real life is that in the laboratory, we're able to take a gene out of one organism, very easy to do these days. Uh, it involves that amplification method that they use in forensics when they find a human hair and want to know the criminal. They can uh, get the genes off the end of that hair. We're able to do this in the laboratory from any organism and take that amplified gene, place it into a compatible context of information, genetic information, and then we use a bacterium that does genetic transfers to move it into the plant cell where we want it to go. And uh, other methods exist too that are a lot more random, but the, the, using the bacterium called agrobacterium, he goes in and does the work for us. He moves the genetic material to that new organism. And then we can have a whole new plant where every cell contains all of that uh, new genetic information that was installed. You've probably heard this term before. You've probably heard it a ton, but frankenfoods. And a lot of people like anti-GMO activists will say, oh, well, you're taking the genes from one species to another. That's got to create some sort of Frankenstein plant. What do you say to those people? I mean, especially after you just said that the genes are totally fine. So what do you say to those people that kind of are fearful of the quote unquote frankenfoods from all this gene editing? Well, I kind of love the term. Because uh, if you think of the of the original book from Frankenstein, um, Frankenstein's monster was the uh, was you know was was what Frankenstein created. You know, uh, Doctor Frankenstein made Frankenstein's monster, who turns out that when it got out of the laboratory, actually wasn't necessarily a bad thing um, until the townspeople decided to destroy it. <laughs> and when they came after it with torches and, and pitchforks, then things broke bad. So in a way, it fits really well because it isn't inherently isn't inheritably inherently wrong. Um, I really kind of don't like those terms because they are terms of derision. That these days we have to be able to genetically adjust plants and animals as fast as we can to meet the challenges that are happening and to feed more people. And to tie the hands of science that can solve a problem is really unethical, in my, my opinion. What would you say are kind of the current issues going on right now? Like, what's the current state of genetic engineering? Are there any recent breakthroughs or what's kind of going on there? Oh, you mean today or yesterday? Oh. <laughs> I mean, Both, it, why not? <laughs> it, is, it is that fast and furious. The new thing that's happening, you can sometimes find uh, referred to as gene editing or sometimes by the technical names of the different methods, CRISPR or Talon or things. But gene editing, if what I described before was word processing and moving a sentence from one book to another, this is erasing a single letter out of a book. And what's so cool about that is that when you erase a single letter out of a gene, out of that genetic code, it sometimes can throw off that gene, that it makes things kind of shift in a way that doesn't work, and, and it, it, it eliminates the function of that gene. And so this is the newest technology. It doesn't leave any um, goodies behind. So in other words, you can make this correction and, or this change, and there's no evidence that you did it other than the changes there. There's no extra genetic hardware around, which is what happened in old school genetic engineering. And some people found that objectionable or potentially problematic. This new stuff removes all of that questionable material. And uh, it wasn't questionable for scientists, but it was for the public. But the, the new methods take that out. So this new method has been used in solving all kinds of problems in plants. It's been um, used in disease for humans. There are trials for sickle cell anemia. Um, there are trials for, uh, we know babies that have been cured for leukemia, which in some cases required the use of these technologies. And this is real, this is now, and it is so fast that you're hard pressed to go on Google News and put in CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, or gene editing, you pull up a news story every single day of a problem being solved. It's, it is the hot time for genetic engineering. 
That's really good to hear. Um, so this might have been news from last week, but I heard on one of your podcasts that there is now um, genetically engineered salmon. And what you've done is turn on the gene for year-round growth. So how exactly was that found out that you can just very specifically change this gene and the salmon will grow all year round? So how was that discovered? Well, what they knew is that salmon grew in episodes. They were episodic um, uh, growers that you would see them go very quickly during some times of year and very slow during other times of year. And that makes sense when the water's cold and maybe the food's not as abundant, metabolism slows and you don't grow. What they figured out was that if you, and that was dictated by a kind of an oscillation of growth hormone, you would see it surge at some times and retreat at other times uh, through the season. What they found a way to do is, what if we could turn on growth hormone all the time and put, plant, put these um, fish in artificial environments where they didn't have an ecological impact? Well, you could make that same fish grow all year round without a break. And this was in 1989 that they first published this, and it was brilliant at the time. They were able to use a uh, part, so a gene has a diff couple different parts. It has the parts with the genetic information, but it has another part that's called a promoter, which is like a on and off switch and a volume knob all in one. And so the promoter they got from a different kind of fish that is always on, always active. And whereas the salmon promoter was turning this on and off with the season, this other promoter from this other fish was on all the time. So it meant that the fish that were in these fish farms can get to market size in half the time. That's huge because you're able to get the food faster, high protein, very valuable food source, but do it with less feed, less waste, and less uh, medication and the other stuff that goes in the fish farming. So a real score. Um, we'll see it on the shelf soon. Yeah, that sounds like a real score. That's really cool. Uh, talking about that, kind of seeing it on the shelf, what, what's the whole approval process like? I, I've heard you on a few podcasts say that Europe is kind of slower. So what's kind of the both the private industry and government regulations on approving genetically engineered products, whether it's fish or produce? Well, I, I mentioned the fish was done, first done in 1989, <laughs> and, and so here we are, what, 30 years later. And so it's still going. <laughs> still going on. Okay, so anybody who says this is a rubber stamp, <laughs> it's the world's longest stamping that ever could happen. Um, the bottom line is, is in animals, it's impossible. Right now, under the current regulatory system, it is just frozen, and uh, it, it's, they treat animals like drugs. So if you make a single change in an animal's genome, you erase one of those letters, that animal now has to be deregulated as a drug, which means all the safety testing, feeding uh, to animals, um, animal tests, um, toxicity tests, um, tests on clinical trials on humans, it is insurmountable and it's expensive. And it can't be done. It just isn't practical. Um, in plants, a little bit different. In plants, it is uh, you change the crop, and then different aspects of the crop go through evaluation through different agencies. They go through the first the FDA to ask, are the products safe to eat? And they do animal studies and other studies. Then it goes through EPA that is it safe to grow? What are the effects on pollinators? Does it um, have any other problems in the field, any other issues in the field? And then the USDA to ask questions about invasiveness and how does it perform on the farm? Uh, can it uh, cross with native species? These are all the questions that happen. It takes many, many years to get that approval and uh, millions of dollars. It's really, really expensive and it keeps, uh, sadly, most small companies and universities out of commercializing this important tool that we can use to feed more people. You seem to be kind of very outspoken and you do a lot of public education, a lot of keynote speaking events to where you're kind of trying to educate people about the science behind genetic engineering. I mean, you've been on the Joe Rogan experience. I've seen many of your Ted talks. I mean, you've got your own podcast talking bio or talking biotech. So, what are some things that you've learned about kind of the whole industry and consumers while you've been trying to educate people? What are some big takeaways that you've gotten? Well, the, the biggest takeaway is that it is not so much about education. And that kills me to say that as a professor. Um, people don't respond to more information. Most people have made up their mind 
they've decided based upon the people they trust what that is. So whether it's somebody online or a website or a celebrity, um, they've shaped those decisions about food and farming. Um, Gwyneth Paltrow has more, much more pull than I do. Um, Dr. Oz, you know, you name it. So this is really what we're up against as scientists and as farmers is pushing back against a very social wave of what isn't necessarily the best information. So as people have made up their mind, how do I change their mind and how do I get the truth to them? And it's not just about giving them information. It's about becoming more trusted than Gwyneth Paltrow and more trusted than Dr. Oz. And I get that by being accessible. They can email me. They can listen to the podcast. They can um, send me, uh, you know, an email. I'll write them back right away. You know, that's the kind of way that we're going to change this as scientists is by building the trust in those connections. And hopefully um, that'll serve as the way we break through here. Our podcast a few weeks ago was right above Gwyneth Paltrow's podcast, which I still can't get over the name of her company, Goop, um, on, on that whole product line. But the, I, I like that, that you're trying, to, you're trying to be accessible to where more and more people can kind of see you and hear your message. I mean, I, I know the answer to this question, but has there been a lot of backlash towards you and your, your thoughts on genetic engineering? Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, it's what, but see, this is what it's about. And, and when I do, I, I, when I do most of my talks these days, I don't talk about genetic engineering. I talk about how we change people's minds and I talk about persuasion and I talk about how we become trusted. And that's the bigger barrier. It, the information's there. We know the facts already. They're, they're well established. The question now, whether you're talking about genetic engineering or vaccines or um, you name it, in vitro fertilization at one time. All of these things are controversial because the public makes it that way and they don't know who to trust. So they take the safe decision, right? I'm not going to vaccinate or I'm not going to eat genetically engineered uh, ingredients from genetically engineered crops. I'll take those safe routes. Um, unfortunately, that hurts other people. And, you know, whether you're getting measles or whether you're um, someone who's starving in another country because you don't have, have access to technology, you know, our decisions here make um, impacts elsewhere. So this is all about trust and how we build trust is by a big part of it is intimacy. How well do people feel that we care about the same things they care about? And so instead of beating somebody to death with data, I say, I worry about my diet. I worry about my niece's diet. I worry about, um, you know, the people who have nothing and, and are food, food insecure. You know, that's the kind of stuff. And I do worry about that. That's not just made up. That's why I do what I do. And I don't talk about how I do it. I talk about why I do it. So when you're folks who are against genetic engineering and you hear me changing hearts and minds by talking about being an independent researcher in a public university, the first thing they're going to do is do anything they can do to tear that down. And it's unfair criticism. It's absolute assaults online. If you Google me, you would never hire me for anything. If you looked on Google images, um, after you composed yourself from laughing, you would feel really bad for me. Um, it's that kind of thing that is what they're trying to do is make me look like somebody you wouldn't want to email or reach out to. And, and that's, that's their game plan. Yeah. I, I've seen, I follow a lot of people on Instagram or Facebook and they're people like dairy farmers or just farmers in general. And there's one farmer that I follow. His name is um, Derek and he, his Instagram is TDF honest farming. And he basically showcases his day in the life of a dairy farmer. And he'll showcase some of the mean comments. Like people will give him death threats. They'll say, Oh, I hope your kids eat tainted meat. And so it's, absolutely ridiculous that some of the links that these anti-science and anti-agriculture people will go to kind of make sure that people are just are that people in the ag industry are being seen as the enemy without them having to do their own research or they're saying oh you're a bad guy i'm not going to change my mind at all yeah well you know if you want to uh, if you've had 10 hours of your podcast i could share with you what i've been through but um, <laughs> it, it's been you know when you get a phone call from someone from the fbi you're at your you're out giving a seminar and they give you instructions about how to think about getting out of a building identifying exits being able to find rooms where you can lock yourself in um and places where you can get cell service while you're locked in um talking to police about that kind of stuff. I had police here the other day um, because of, you know, the tangible threats. Um, 
Uh, my office got broken into at one point. Someone poured coffee all over everything and broke into the computer with a thumb drive. Um, downloaded a bunch of stuff. Um, nothing mattered, but but these are but you see um, they, the other day they put or May they put my social security number online. They put my home address. They put my um, bank account information online. Um, my it's constant and but this is the price of deciding that you're going to have the courage to tell the truth and you're going to talk about science in ways that people understand whether or not some other people may object to that and uh and but you know that's the tip of the iceberg i mean the amount of crud i've been through is amazing but um at the end of the day and at the end of hopefully 2020 or so um I'll, I'll uh, get some apologies and the nonsense will stop. Man, good Lord. Good on you for, for keeping up that good fight. I, I can't imagine. I mean, having your social security number out there, bank account, your, your office getting broken into. I mean, I'm sure like that's your sanctuary on campus and just to have somebody break into there and pour coffee everywhere is just horrible, man. Good. That was kind of a, um, you know, I, I just kind of threw my hands up in the air and said, this, this is stupid. I, it, it gets, it, it gets to the point where you're so fed up with it that it almost doesn't matter anymore. And I hate to say that. Um, the thing that bothers me, the only time it does bother me is when they say things online, like he is a wife beater or a child molester or, um, you know, abuses animals or any of the stuff they put about me, which they put it all. Um, that kind of stuff is really bad because they build whole stories around this and they build whole volumes on websites. And if I ever went to be in university leadership again or anything like that, I, I could never do it because any university is, you know, they, they would be considering me very strongly based on the merits of my research career, my leadership experience. But somebody would write in and say, no, you can't do it. He's a child molesting wife beater and he's, uh, drunk and, and, you know, and, and a university would say, you know what, we don't want to take a chance with that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, how precautious they are these days and even companies, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, um, it kind of puts a glass ceiling on me. Um, that's probably the worst thing. The other really bad thing is because when they say something bad about you, here he is poisoning children with his corporate products in back pocket of Monsanto who, you know, they say things like that and then they'll say, and here's his address. And it's some idiot in California who does it, who's trying to excite a lone wolf here in Florida to come over and hurt, you know, my animals or, you know, bother my wife or whatever. And that's really unfair. And they can go after me all they want. Fine, bring it. I'll deal with you. But, I don't, you know, leave everybody else alone. And I just don't want to walk home and find, you know, someone whipped a, a bottle of gas, you know, lit, lit on fire through the window of my house. You know, and, and that's the kind of stuff I worry about. Yeah, no, I don't blame you. I mean, w once you attack your family and, I mean, your house, that's when it gets super personal and it's not okay. I mean, I feel like, especially in today um, – there's problems with disagreeing with people. We cannot disagree with people without making it personal, especially on social media and the internet. I mean, if somebody disagrees with you, then you're, they're an idiot. They're a racist. They're like you said, like a child molester. It, it, there seems to be just no end inside of it. I mean, have you seen anything going on to where people or maybe the FBI or police departments are trying to crack down on all this misinformation that just activists are just throwing out there to kind of throw people off of what they're trying to do to help improve the world? Well, I think that uh, Facebook has started to make some overtures against the anti-vaccination folks. And the anti-genetic engineering ones are not far behind. They work from the same playbook. I'm a little bit um, less confident that they're going to go after the anti-GE folks anytime soon. Uh, Twitter is a hellhole. Um, they've seen the abuse that I endure there and the things people say. And they say, well, just block that account. Well, fine, I block it. But they talk to everybody else saying things about me that aren't true. Um, so the only way to defeat this, the only way to do it is you have to develop more good media than th that matters than they can do disparaging work. There's only a few of them. And to be on your podcast, to be on with Rogan or Dr. Drew or any of the other places I've been, that's where we really start to amplify the good stuff 
that hopefully people will have the filters to be able to say, okay, this guy's not so bad. This is all a bunch of garbage and I'm going to support this guy going forward. That's what we need more of. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of just articles written from people's view of you, actually see you and hear you and see your thoughts and what your research does. Then you put a face to it and like, oh yeah, I have this stuff out there is garbage. I'm going to actually believe it from him. Man, well, well, power to you. I wish you the best of luck. I hope all that stuff improves. I can't imagine going through all that. I would have just quit months ago. So seriously, good on you. Um, so moving on to happier topics. Let, let's talk about your podcast, Talking Biotech Podcast. You've covered a lot of really cool stuff. You've covered how HIV prevention in genetically engineered rice, even countering disinformation in places like Africa and their GE crops. So what kind of got you interested? I mean, I know you want to get your message out there, but what are some things that kind of made you start the podcast and what are your goals with the podcast going forward? <laughs> well, people always said, you should do a podcast. And I was on the radio in high school and I did a lot of speech and debate stuff in college and always had um, a knack to be able to talk to people and enjoyed kind of developing interview skills through, through time. And uh, I didn't want to do a podcast. I saw it being as a medium that fit me perfectly. People would say, oh, you've got to do it. And I, I resisted. I resisted. <laughs> I might have been one of the first ones otherwise. So I did start doing a podcast where I did one called the Vern Blathek Thigh and Power Hour with your host, Vern Blathek. And I did the funny <laughs> voice. And I interviewed people in the voice like this about some serious scientific topic. And it was actually kind of funny. Uh, it wasn't that funny, but it was medium funny. And um, uh, uh, one particular journalist found, I asked her to be on at, as Fulton. I said, Hey, could you be on this podcast? I do it as a kind of a funny voice and we do it that way. And she thought this was the biggest conspiracy of all time and wrote a horrible article about me being not uh, transparent and deceptive and all. And I was just doing a funny podcast. And if you look at, you know, sciencepowerhour.com, I think it's all gone now, but any of the screenshots from it, you could see it was just uh, like a hilarious, stupid kind of Devo esque, you know, you know, parody of the, um, you know, coast to coast AM at night, that weirdo UFO show overnight. And um, after that went down, I did talking biotech and said, you know, I'm just going to do this as me. And here we go. And that's five years ago now, uh, or four years ago now, four and a half. And uh, so that was what really got me into it. And I've just loved the idea that every week I have, I, now I'm getting companies calling me and saying, can we be on your podcast? And I have to tell them, well, we can't do it as a commercial. We can do it as a, you know, talking about your technology. So now I got people calling me saying we need to be on. We get between 3,500 and 5,000 downloads a week, which is great for a stupid podcast with me on it. And um, going forward, I, I think we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Maybe some new kinds of media that I'm playing with. I have a really cool idea or two that we're going to do, but look forward to more media, more video um, that'll come from some live, upper, live um, things we're going to do, as well as some interesting ways to rate the next, the Netflix videos and that swamp. <laughs> <laughs> nice. There you go. Yeah. I've heard more and more people are going to podcasts now, especially for news and I mean, just the whole radio content is really cool. And I mean, especially if y'all go to YouTube, a lot of people love YouTube videos. So we'll be looking for videos on there as well. That's really cool. Yeah. Listen to some of your, your podcasts are really cool. Just to kind of get an understanding of kind of your research and your grasp on all this stuff. They're really good to listen to. And we'll be sure to link them in our little description of this episode. Uh, random and off the cuff. I really would get your answer on this. What are your thoughts on the non GMO product verified label? Oh boy. Um, it, it, it's, so the, the problem, the reason I don't like it is um, because it's disingenuous and it was started not because it was there to inform people. It started as a way to polarize people. And it was a, you know, the, it was people who are in the, you know, natural foods movement, whatever that means, who decided that they would create this label. And since you couldn't get labeling for contains genetic, you know, ingredients from genetic engineered crops, you could put this non GMO project uh, sticker on things. I just think it's disingenuous because they put it on things where there is no genetic engineered product. And then they equate it with risk on their website and their media as do others. They say, well, if you don't see this, you're going to get cancer. 
And if you don't see this, your kids are going to become autistic. And they use, they use it to um, lay the foundation of false information. And that's something I can't stand for. Yeah, I totally agree. The one that always kind of drives me nuts is the, um, the pink Himalayan sea salt that will have the non-GMO product verified <laughs> label on there. I'm like, this is a mineral. You just get it from the earth and that's it. Like you don't genetically engineer salt. Yeah, uh, it's a great example. My favorites are uh, the uh, non-GMO water. And the, <laughs> I have not seen that one yet. Oh, yeah. It's a, and the um, non-GMO kitty litter is a really good one. And um, I, I always thought, and, but this non-GMO project, they make money hand over fist by licensing out this uh, sticker to, there's package decoration uh, to different organizations. And I saw one thing, it was in like a smaller health food store, one small brand. They made a non-GMO project sticker that looked exactly like that one, um, only with a ladybug on it. And it was a little bit different because they didn't want to pay the royalties to this crooked company to be able to use that label. So that was kind of cool. And it, it, I did a blog once on Medium about the non-ghost project. And it was about a realtor who couldn't sell a house that was the same as every other house in the neighborhood, but he, uh, he wanted to get a little extra money for it. So he put a non-ghost project sticker on it. It was certified to be specter free. And anybody who knows about science knows that, you know, there's no ghosts, there's nothing like that. But to a certain number of people who believe in superstitious science free thinking, that meant a lot. And he sold the house the next day. And it, it's the same thing. It's protecting you from nothing, yet it scares significant number of people away from lower cost, uh, perfectly fine food. Yeah, exactly. They're going to see the product that says non-GMO and be like, oh, well, anything that does have GMOs in it is obviously going to be bad. So let me buy the non-GMO product and save our health. It might be a little bit more money, but it's an investment. And have you seen the new, the, I don't know if it's out on anything yet, but the USDA has made this new GMO food label where it just has like a little field and it says bioengineered on it. Have you seen that yet? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, I was front and center in that whole discussion of how to do that. And nobody listens to me. I, I thought it was, it's, it's a horrible idea as it means now it officially means nothing to everybody. <laughs> what, why do you, th why do you think it's a bad idea? Well, it, it, it's, it still designates certain foods as having implied risk. And to some people, that's what that may mean to other people, the term bioengineered. I mean, what, what does that mean? Even though a scientist, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So it's, it's really um, puts the USDA in a funny place. They're, they've capitulated to the demands of food terrorists to, de to put a decoration on a package. And then they put a pa one on there that is easily misinterpreted or misunderstood. And just not clear in terms of how we tell the truth about food. Right. Okay. Those are some really good points. I haven't thought about that. So going forward... What do you see, and I mean, you, you said it talks very, or the, the industry goes very, very fast. Long term, like 5, 10, 20 years, what do you see as the future of genetic engineering? Do you have any really cool thoughts or do you have any concerns about kind of where it's going? Oh, wow. That's a great question because this thing is moving so fast that a 20-year time horizon is not even in the, in the cards. Five years ago, we could not have predicted gene editing working as well as it is and new types of nucleases, so what they call site-directed nucleases. So site-directed nuclease means that it can go into the DNA, which you have, let's say, 3.6 billion bases, 3.6 billion letters, and they give you a perspective on that. That's if, if 3.6 billion seconds is about 100 years. So you can go back to you know, August 23rd, 1941 at, 1.23 p.m. and 18 seconds, and that would be the, the resolution of the edits we can make. It's one second in 100 years, and we can do that now, and we, we call the site-directed nucleases. These are getting more precise and better all the time, and what this means is that we can disrupt the genes that cause disease, uh, different diseases. We can uh, change susceptibility in plants to disease. We can change the factors that limit yields. There are so many things that we can do now um, that we couldn't do five or six years ago. And the future is coming even faster. And my biggest fear is that the universities won't be able to keep up with companies because there's not enough funding and um, 
we and things happen at a slightly different pace. And when technology is breaking loose on the order of weeks and months, and we're waiting years, um, it, it puts us at serious disadvantage. All right. So random question. Anytime I try to explain kind of genetic engineering with people that aren't in the, in the industry, I kind of bring the conversation to carrots and how carrots were first purple and they weren't orange and they were only bred to be, to be orange later on down the road. I think in, in um, the Dutch did it in the 17th century, I believe. What, what would you say is the main difference between kind of cultivating carrots, kind of how they did back then to where it wasn't technically genetic engineering to genetically engineering plants now. So how would you kind of compare and contrast those two procedures? Yeah. So the way I always think about it is, you know, engineering by definition is the use of math and science to change structure and performance of something, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I don't know that I would call traditional breeding engineering because let's look at it this way. The plants that were here on this planet 20, 30,000 years ago were not that useful for food. And people were hunting and gathering and they were wandering around in the savannas and looking, you know, flipping over rocks and eating grubs and beetles and anything you could find. And it was a horrible existence. If you could find some tender roots or shoots or something, you would eat them or flowers that wouldn't kill you. Um, you would eat them. And eventually humans were, it took some of, they figured out what seeds were and that if you took some seeds home, you could grow this stuff at home. And that changed everything because now you've taken those seeds out of their ecological context and you planted maybe some seeds on your on your space or maybe they just happened there because you threw out the garbage and you didn't eat the seeds and then the plants grew and people thought oh wow we we actually can move our food and um let's say you have a bunch of these seeds growing and the next year an insect attack comes and all of them die except for one and that's because it had genetics that allowed it to survive. Now that one's the only one that makes seeds. In the next season, you've got a, an insect-resistant crop. Humans just participated in genetic modification. And that idea of genetic modification through time was humans improving plants by breeding and selection. And we didn't even know we were doing it, but we were dramatically changing the genetics of crops that were becoming better for us and less likely to survive in the, in the wild. We did this for 10,000 years, and in the 1900s, got very good at uh, making crosses and selective breeding and picking the right parents to make better offspring. And in the 1980s and 90s and now, we can now move genes one at a time with great resolution and surgically to be able to make plants that can survive very well. And so we're doing the same. Th this is engineering, though. Back then, I think it was circumstance, it was dumb luck, it was educated guesses um, through plant breeding times, through the 1800s, 1900s, um, until the 70s, 80s, 90s, even now with some crops. But now we have the opportunity to do very careful marker-assisted breeding or genome-guided breeding, or you know, we can do a lot of more stuff with great precision now. Engineering is like the gene editing or, you know, like I said before, the um, transgenic technology where we can move one gene or erase one letter. That's the big difference. It just is much more precise and much more directed and really much more safe. Okay. That makes much more sense then. That kind of helps me understand it a little bit more. Um, so what are some things that people can do to support the science behind genetic engineering and just support science in general? Because I know there's a lot of misinformation out there. So what can, con what can consumers and even farmers do to better support science education when it comes to genetic engineering? Yeah, the easiest thing farmers in, in North America can do is share your stories. Um, talk about why you do what you do. Take pictures of the farming operation. Show the crops you grow. You know, to a farmer, a, a seedling coming out of the ground is like, yeah, big deal. But to someone online who never has been on a farm, that's the closest they've ever been. And we have to share those stories. Talk about your spraying plants with, with, with an herbicide, spraying to limit weeds with an herbicide that's 99.99% water and that your kids can go in that field five minutes after you spray and it's safe. You know, this is the kind of stuff you need to share. Um, for others, just the average person, learn the stories of how technology 
and it can be genetic engineering, it can be cell phones, it can be medicine, I don't care. Learn how technology can help the people in the most, in the most need. And to me, genetic engineering can make profound impacts on people in profound food insecurity. The people who will, 21,000 will die today because of lacking a trace element in their diet. It's not just calories. It may be a little tiny bit of zinc, a tiny bit of iron, a tiny bit of vitamin A. And we have genetic solutions that can fix that. But because of the pushback and the non-GMO stickers and the people who say it's poison, folks in places like Uganda will tell me, well, if it's not good enough for the Europeans, why is it good enough for me? And I have to say, well, you know, I, I don't know how to explain that. Um, know the stories and know how technology can help people and share those stories because that's the only way the stuff will ever get to them. I like it. That's really good advice. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the Uganda banana. I listened to one of your podcasts and it's called Matoke, if, if that's correct. Um, and it had more vitamin A and it's kind of been going back and forth about whether it's going to be officially put in use. So tell us a little bit more about the Matoke banana in Uganda. Yeah, this was one of the most emotional times of my life. You know, most people talk about graduating school or birth of a child or getting married. Mine was standing in a banana field in Africa. <laughs> I mean, this was really, really crazy. So I was in uh, the Kawanda Research Park, which is a, which is a long, bumpy road ride outside of uh, um, Kampala, Uganda. And what they have there is African scientists created a banana that they call matoke. It's kind of more, much more of a plantain. And they use this for a foundation of every meal. The, the matoke banana is the um, rice in a Chinese dish, for instance. It's the foundation, the starch in that meal. And it's culturally what they call food. You know, if you give someone that meal without the matoke, they go, well, that's, you know, that's not food. Well, um, the problem they have in the lakes region of Africa is vitamin A, a deficiency. And we do a nice job in the West with eating vitamin A. We get plenty of it from fruits and vegetables. And um, mom always said eat carrots because they're good for your vision. And she was right. They're full of something called beta carotene, that orange pigment. Bananas don't make much of that. There's one banana that does. And it's called the um, uh, fe banana, F-E hyphen I. And it's grown in Fiji. The problem is you can't cross bananas very easily, right? They don't make seeds. You know, we have them sterile. They have too many chromosomes, whatever. So what scientists did was take the genes that were from that Fiji banana and put them into the Matoke banana. And now you have a Matoke banana, this, you know, traditional African banana that everybody wants that makes vitamin A, uh, beta carotene anyway. The body converts it to vitamin A. That matters because something like 35% of children in that area suffer from vitamin A blindness. And you have a deficiency of vitamin A in the diet. You first go blind as a child. You usually die before five from immune system failure, diarrhea, and all kinds of other problems. Um, African scientists, uh, Priver Nemanja, Dr. Priver Nemanja, along with a guy named uh, Dr. James Dale from Australia and uh, Lena Tripathi from, uh, she was in Kenya. They made this banana with that Fiji banana gene. And I was in the field with her, with Priver Nemanja, Dr. Nemanja, and she went up in the tree and she got a banana down and she cut it in half and it was orange. <laughs> and here is the solution to help those blind kids. It's right there. It's right there and it's growing and it's great and it's perfect and it's done by scientists from Uganda and Kenya and they're going to give it away, but they can't because it's genetically engineered and the government has no rules for how to release and test a genetically engineered product. Their parliament, nah, they're kind of the wealthy guys who have some food and they say well we don't need this the europeans don't need it neither do we you know look in the united states that they you know people don't want this uh it, it's only the corporations shoving it down our throats it's, no it's not it's river pneumonia it's dr pneumonia and you know so um this to me is really horrible because here is a place where i saw the problem in children who are blind and i saw the solution on the same day and the difference is they're on different sides of a barbed wire fence. 
And as a scientist, it rips your heart out to see that. And, and I'll never forget that. Man, I can imagine. I mean, you have the answer. You've created the answer. You can simply solve the problems. And because of bureaucracy and just these, these random government laws, you can't do it. Man. Well, well and, all, and, and also all of the people who say it's poison and that it's a problem and that it's going to hurt people. You know, the green pieces are alive and well in Uganda saying that if you eat this, you um, will get cancer. Um, in many countries around Africa, they talk about orange beta carotene as, in, and this is, these are places which are not accepting of people's choices in terms of, um, uh, of mates and things where they'll say um, that it'll turn you homosexual you know, which in many places is culturally uh, something they, that has not been acceptable yet. Right. And, um, and they, they say this very clearly on the radio and in other media, and it pushes back against something that can help kids. And all of this starts in the West. Yeah, man, that kind of makes it all kind of, you can see the bigger picture that even that people, when they spread misinformation online, because they just click it, it, sounds interesting and they'll share it that it's having drastic impacts on people on the other side of the world where i mean they're like these people in uganda can't have that banana so you're going to have countless kids get sick or die because there's just so much misinformation out there that is that's really heartbreaking yeah and it was horrible to stand there in the middle of those trees because they were big and beautiful and it was getting dark really fast when i was there but you stood underneath this canopy of trees and you said you know, how, how can I get one out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a guy with a rifle at the gate and you sign in and sign out, but you know, you, you, you just think if there was just a way to, you know, everything, anything I could do in my power, my stupid insignificant power to be able to, to fix this. And all I can do is talk to you about it and hope that you get a jillion listeners and they share the story. That's the way we get justice for people. And all these folks who say, oh, it's all about food justice and, you know, Monsanto ruling the food supply. No, it's not. It's about justice is about getting solutions that matter and innovations that can help people to the people they're designed to help. That's yeah. what justice is about. Totally, totally agree. Have you heard any updates this year or the past couple of weeks on that project? I mean, is it still just not going through? Well, back when I was there, um, part of the reason I was there was to meet with the science minister and answer his questions and to get him ready to go. And a brilliant guy, he was a medical doctor, had a lot of questions, but he was ready to go. And we got him all briefed and he went in and he got the change uh, so that the legislature could begin to come up with rules to uh, change it. And I got the text message from him and, and I cried. I was so happy that he got the change to start this. And a few weeks later, the president vetoed it. <laughs> oh, man. Like, and and then I then I just went and had a beer and decided that I was. <laughs> That's a roller coaster of emotions. Right? Oh. It's finally going to go through, and then nope, vetoed. Oh no! And you know, and all the kids who had their you know their vision was getting a little bit lousy, and they went, oh geez. But yeah. no, seriously, I mean, you know, not to make light of it, it, it it's such it, it was, and, and it was pr the president's wife who talked him into it. And, and so we're, once again, have people with means and affluence, um, you know, in these countries where there's many poor who are um, uh, making decisions that hurt people because they're afraid of science. And that's where we got to we got to fix it. Yeah, all about improving science literacy here um, at home in a way. Man, that's sombering. Um, well, Dr. Folta, this has been a really cool conversation. i um, learning about all things about genetic engineering if people want to follow you, um, they can go to your, your podcast. It's, um, it's Talking Biotech Podcast. What are you guys, twice a week or once weekly? Oh, geez, once a week is enough. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, once a week. Yeah, I found it on Spotify. It's on iTunes. It's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, if people want to follow more of your work, where can they go? Well, I have a blog called Illumination, which is you can find just by Googling Illumination in my name or KevinFoltaBlog.com. Um, also on Twitter, and I'm on Twitter at Kevin Fulta. That's a good place to find me. And most importantly, reach out if you ever have questions, ever have concerns, or read something that you're unsure about. You know, share it with me uh, and maybe we'll put it up on the blog for everyone to understand. Um, I'm a land grant scientist at an important institution here in Florida and in the nation. And my job is to re help you. So reach out if I can be of assistance. I mean that very sincerely. 
Awesome. I love your transparency. I mean, you were, I think I, my friend Daniel Leonard told me about you and um, I emailed you and within five minutes you were like, yeah, let's do the podcast. So your transparency is awesome. It's very admirable. I appreciate that. Um, well, we will send as many people we can your way. Dr. Folta, thank you so much. Best of luck in your, your future and with the future of genetic engineering. We'll be paying close attention. Cool. And I'll come back on when they approve that Matoki banana and we'll uh, raise a glass to the people who now get to live their lives with vision and, and health. Um, hey, it's yeah, coming. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I pray it's coming soon. Um, yeah, we'll toast a beer whenever that happens. We'll keep you updated and we'll, we'll be listening for you. Well, Dr. Fulton, best of luck. Thanks for being on, man. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Again, thanks so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Folta. If you enjoyed it, share it. I know there's a lot of people out there that really need to hear this information. So share it with them on Facebook. Share them our iTunes page. Share, share, share. The more people hear about agriculture and what's going on in the industry, the better. Leave us a review on iTunes if you can. We would greatly appreciate it. Five stars or four stars. Or, you know, if you hate the sound of my voice, you can leave it one star too. That's fine. I'll only be a little bit sad. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode.